Three, two, one. What's happening, everyone? Welcome back to the greatest podcast you've never heard of. This is I'm something starting different. to think that they might actually start to hear from me at the caliber of guest we're getting uh, into this. Sean McComb's on. Good, good podcast. Sean McComb. The public nuisance, the uh, professional boxer. He's 11 and 0 now with um, uh, MTK Promotions. Uh, it was great chat, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really, really good. Um, uh, he's a good lad, so he's very open and honest. Yeah. Talk us through a bit about his career and the, just the current state of boxing and stuff, which is really interesting. Sort of like a follow-up thing, because we obviously had, we had Paddy Barnes on, and we kind of went over similar ground that we'll talk to the Paddy, yeah. but it was good just to get another perspective on things. It's good because Paddy Barnes was retired, so he was able to kind of shed light, and it was good to get someone like Sean on, so because he's actually still involved in boxing. He's And he talked about the corruption and politics in boxing, something that... We can see from the outside, but we want to know what's it like from the inside, knowing that all this corruption and and uh, I was like the politics and boxing involved in just getting a fight together or mm-hmm. even fixing a fight or people cheating or two. It's just fucking dark, isn't it? Yeah, it was really interesting because it's stuff that so you always hear you always you know it like everyone knows boxing's corrupt. It's like it's yeah. the one thing. It's like the sky's blue and boxing's corrupt. But yeah. whenever you actually speak to a fighter who suffers it. And that's was one thing that Sean done well is that it tells about how it's a, these young kids' lives are getting affected by this by just someone's decision mm-hmm. by the corruptness of it. So, yeah, yeah, it was good, but yeah, um, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, and obviously, given the state of the whole COVID fucking situation, we are going to be using Zoom for the foreseeable future. Yeah, but it's not too bad. No, it seems okay. Seems yeah, okay. but uh, yeah, shout out to Kieran Doran for setting this up. Kieran Doran, uh, obviously, he knows Sean. Gas, gas together and was able to set up a wee podcast. So shout out to Kieran for that there. Cheers, lad. Yeah. So hope you enjoy. You are now listening to MT Podcasting. Hi, right, Sean. How's it going, mate? How you keeping? It's going. All good. Thanks for having me on, lads. No, thanks for coming on here. Uh, by the way, your nickname, like the, the public nuisance, is a cracker, by the way. Like, I love how you fucking took that and like, as the, it was meant to be like, almost like a negative towards you yeah. and you totally flipped it on you. Now you have t-shirts and your hat and all and obviously your nickname now is the public nuisance. Yeah, no, that's it. Turned the negative into a positive. Um, obviously, <clears throat> all that was going on at the time, um, it was a bit mad, but crazy in Australia. All the media, all the attention, all for the wrong reasons. Like, yeah, and me you... obviously supposed to be out there being team captain, acting in a professional manner. But one of my mates, Marty, my best mate, Marty Hara, for me, and he was like, ah, "This is the best thing that's ever happened to you. Trust <laughs> me, this is gonna be amazing. And all this is gonna be amazing." Yeah. And then all the lads in a group chat changed the name of the group chat to the public nuisance. <laughs> and I'm just with me holding like the police reference number in a cell. That they oh. took from my Instagram and put it as a, the profile, uh, as the WhatsApp logo on the on the group chat. Yeah. And this group chat is called the Public Nations. So and they all just started calling me the Public Nations, and that just stuck with me. And I got, I got that, that's my new nickname. For uh, it is kind of spicy because uh, you were actually <laughs> innocent. You know what? It's different if you were actually yeah. were guilty. I think that makes it even better because you knew deep down you argued your case the whole time. Like I didn't do fuck all basically. So you knew like you, you could actually hold that and turn it into a positive. Yeah, hundred percent. I knew the whole time. I was. I knew for a fact I was innocent. And the Commonwealth Committee were trying to trying to send me home the next day. I refused to answer, or I refused to go home. Mm-hmm. I was. I was staying out of the village at this stage, and I wouldn't go back to the village because I knew they were going to send me home. So I stayed out in a friend's house in Australia. And um, the John Conlon, Big Damian Martin, Pete Brady, all the boxing boys, all the ones from Sport and I stuck by me big time and fought my case and. I got to review the CCTV from the nightclub and the scene that it was innocent. So it was it was probably a bit hard for because they had fighters still in the competition and they were very busy ratting and coming out of the arenas and going straight to the police and looking at all this stuff and still trying to fight my case. But in the end, it stuck by me and we played all. So. <laughs> but here, I want to ask, so what actually, I was listening to you on uh, Paddy Barnes' podcast and you said basically like that you still owe them money, like a fine they give you. So are you still like... Uh-huh. So were you found not gu- were you found guilty or not guilty? I was found not guilty, but the fine was still the fine still stood. I don't know why they were saying I said it's not penal because I'm innocent. And they were like, Yeah, but you still caused you still caused 
uh, nuisance in the area. Even though you were defending yourself, but you still caused. And I was like, well, how come the fucking doormen aren't getting trained? $765. Yeah. And I said, I'm not him, but I just refuse to pay it. Do you think because of the whole situation and obviously you being a boxer, they were trying to make a bit of an example of you? Uh, I really think it was. Because see, like, see, the, see the calm off committee, like, they're decades. It's big time, like, see, there's a boy or a Robert. Robert, um, I'm not sure his name, the second name, I forget it at the minute. I'll probably come back to me, but he, he's the head of the Commonwealth Committee and he's a fucking ar- arsehole. Like, he just wanted me gone out. That he, he, There's an orange fella. Um, he's actually from about the road, this fella I'm talking about too as well. What's his name? Um, oh, I'll come back to me, but he plays for St. John's. He's a St. John's man, like, and he was on the committee and he was fucking like, putting my name in the paper and all, saying that I was acting in a sheepish behaviour. And all this shit when it wasn't true. I was like, what's he talking about? He knows nothing. And he says that I'd spoke to him while I was out of the village and he's okay and this and that. And uh he's he's very apologetic towards his teammates and this and he's very apologetic to and I was like, no way I didn't say anything about it. All bullshit. Why do you think it, why do you think that was the case? Like why do you think he was trying to tarnish your name? Something that, I don't know, just trying to cover their own back that I was wrong. Basically they're probably getting a bit of shit from the authorities of sport and I, whatever, I said, what's going on over, whatever, whatever. And then boxing as well, I believe, because she would have been a runner, a yeah. sprinter, mm-hmm. athletics, they would have backed the hills, would have been all with their men, they're all just fucking stuck up their own holes. Do you think boxing, just boxing in general, gets a bad name in, the, in, that, in, the, in that sense? Uh, I will, it does, people, people know, like, so many people to go away with, you can see the difference. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We're working class, we come from working class area, and nine, nine times out of ten, boxers do come from working class areas. Obviously, that's where all the boxing clubs are formed. Yeah. And, and you can just see that different sports sort of turn their nose up. Yeah. Like, like, I've seen it, I've seen it loads of times before. Like, they automatically just assume we're all headers. Same we yeah. look at sport and I and I are all that like all the people we train with over the years is like S and C coaches and stuff for all lessons up there. But some of them are like you can see they turn their nose up, do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like the hand up ones, some of them turn their nose up a bit and you're like, fuck Emmons. They're just you know what I mean, and then they look at you automatically and go, well, these are like they're headers and they laugh at you know, but they're like, these are headers. Only just having a bit of crack, like they're all fucking <sighs> And that's the good thing about boxing, and it? It, it's literally one of them sports that you don't need money to do. And obviously, you, if you want to move up on it, you need money and stuff. But to start off, you just need a few quid to join a, a gym and to start, I say, punching a bag, going for a run, doing sit up, skipping all. Do you yeah. don't need like if you start golfing or you start like anything like that? <laughs> fuck's sake, you play game. golf, you have to pay about two and a half grand to join a golf club. Just just to play know. golf. That's <laughs> mad. That's not even including your lessons and your clubs. Uh, right. I actually had this argument. Well, my bird, like the other day, like she's still like on your full shit. You always play the victim, saying like, "Yeah, I mean, I'm not playing a victim. My areas don't have tennis clubs in them. Yeah, they don't have, like no, like that's because you just rack them all. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like, but don't like we, we're not going to get that good things. We don't like. I mean, sure, boxing clubs don't get racked. Football True. clubs don't get racked. Court and Mona GAC, up in Turf Road doesn't get racked. Yeah, me there after because they're fenced off and they're hanging. Yeah, and yeah, I understand. Yes, the kids do rack stuff like parks and stuff like that, and they shouldn't do that. I disagree with that big time, but we're not going to, you're never going to get a kid playing tennis and turf floor, so that's called space. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. Sure, go over to Malone, uh, go over to Malone, who's tennis. I mean, who's going to bring their kid over to Malone to play tennis? <laughs> <laughs> One in Turf Lodge goes up to go, I'm going to put my kid in the tennis. But if there's tennis courts in Turf Lodge, kids will go and play tennis. And if exactly. they're good enough, yes, they'll go and play tennis. But if they're not, if they're not going to be good enough because they're not playing it. <laughs> I think that's, that, that's the importance of like boxing clubs and even football clubs in like working class areas. Like, because they get kids off the street. And did you see that yeah. when you were growing up? Obviously, you was it you grew up in West Belfast, was it yourself? Mm-hmm. Turf Lodge, I grew up still live there, like, um, in West Belfast. Holy yes. Trinity Boxing Club. I would say in 2000 when Holy Trinity reopened, it got a new gym formed. It had new, all new gym, new facilities, class gym. And I think I was eight at the time. I told her brothers boxed. And I would say it was about, it was easy, 150 members. like, mm. And all from the area. I'd say whenever you were, obviously you started when you were eight, did you know, how long did it take you to know that I'm going to be a boxer? 
was it something that you like that when you started doing it when you got a bit older did you realize you just had a talent for it or was it something you just had to really work for I was I was I was really talented as a kid but I, I'd sort of underachieved because of it because I didn't train mm-hmm. like I used to just show up a lot of the time and just like for example going to train I would have showed up to train and I wouldn't I wouldn't train that I just messed about run about the club and Maybe done a bit of bags and split the, split again in the youth club next door, play football, and then the same again the next night, and and then that go back for a week because we just run about the streets in the area, and then I'd have had fights coming up, and I'd have just jumped in and probably be the one. Like I won the Atoms, won the Ulsters, could never win the All Irelands, which was the big, which was the big goal for me because I, my two older brothers were Irish champions, and I always looked up the Emmons, but I couldn't win them. It was winning the Ulsters, winning the Atoms every year, and then. Falling short in the All Irelands, I got beat in the final, but like when I was twelve, and then people were like, "You'll win them, you'll win them," and it disheartened me and all. And I was like, "I'm coming back to boxing, I'm finishing boxing." Because at this stage, I was playing Gaelic, I was playing hurling, I was playing football. Playing all the sports. I didn't care, but I kept going. I was like, "Right, I need to win the Irish title." That was my main dream. Like, because my brothers tortured me. Like, I see your shit, your shit. Can I win the Irish title? You'll never win Jesus. the Irish title. Tortured me like you'll never win the Irish title. You'll never win the Irish title. They always had one over me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this thing, I'm going to nice title and kept training. And then one year, I think it was 15, and I was like, I'm going to give it a go this year. It was the first year of property. I think my old amateur coach, Mickey Hawkins, brought a fella called Billy McLean in from another gym to train me, focus mainly on me to get me fit. And he came in and got me fit, and I won the all Ireland. And then I've won them every year after it. Oh, really? That's <laughs> right, up until, right up until elite level, so... Um. Yeah. So when I turned fifteen, it was the first time in the Irish elites, or first time in an Irish title, and then I represented Ireland, I think, in a wee international fight, and I loved it. And then I went to the Europeans with the Irish under eighteen team, even though I was only like sixteen at the time, and I started going away on these trips and was representing Ireland, and it was. I just loved it. And I was like, fuck this. I never worked in my life. I don't want so, to work. <laughs> so it was that first All Ireland you won. It's like kind of like, all right, I can. This can be a career. Uh, it was because it was like, it was the first time actually training hard and yeah. winning and got relief of winning. And then something that I always wanted to achieve was an Irish title. And then my brothers couldn't have that over me, but they, they, it was always, but we have more. We have, my brother has five Irish titles. I like, well, I'll get five Irish titles. He's like, go ahead. So I went and won and that's happening. And I sort of thought to myself, like, I want to be a, I want to go to the Olympics and that was it I sort of had my name main set I want to go to the Olympics I want to go to the Olympics and I just kept pushing and training and I won the elite Irish title and then from there I became a full time athlete and still yeah, here so till the day. What, still what it, was it good having your brothers like that because on one hand they pushed you to be more competitive but on the other hand they kept you grounded like you never got too uh, big headed because they had as I said they had the belts over you or the all islands over you yeah, that's it. They, they did push me in a way. Any other kid would probably take away, most kids would probably go like, like disbelief in themselves. Especially mm-hmm. now, full of wimps. Kids just go into this wee fucking shell because people are telling them they're not good enough. But they were telling me I'm not good enough and I knew I was good enough. Yeah. So my my personality was reactive towards it. Like, I, I'll win this, I'll win this, I'll win this. And I knew in my head I, I couldn't stop until I won it. And when I won it, I was like, wait there a minute, I'll win an Orwell. I'll win an Orwell. And then, Everyone started talking about me, like, fuck, this kid's good. And just, I was enjoying it. Still, I, just, I, I just couldn't stop losing it. I couldn't stop winning. <laughs> yeah. And here, yeah. so, you know, you obviously, your dream was to go to the Olympics and uh, you didn't get to go. Was it, yeah. was it, I, as we were talking to Paddy Barnes about this here, and he obviously, he was an amateur up until he was 29. It seemed like you made the jump, the professional, quite soon on. Would you have held out at the amateur level for a bit longer and went for another Olympics? Nah, not now, nah, because obviously with COVID and all, like the Olympics have been put back, so it would have been another year wasted in my life. Oh, true. Um, right now, I'm loving professional boxing, loving my career. I would never, I've no regrets up to now. I think I've done everything exactly what I planned out to do. The only big regret is obviously not going to the Olympics. That mm-hmm. was probably my, of my own fault with weight issues and getting caught between two weights and um, just wasn't meant to be. Were you ever close to going? Like, were you, were you ever like in touch and distance? Yeah, again? I went to the qualifiers in 2015. Um, at 60 kilograms, I fought, I beat the number 10 in the world, Brazilian. He was ranked number 10 in the world. I beat him. 
And then, no, sorry, I didn't beat the, the Mexican at the World Championships. He was number 10 in the world. And then the next fight, I drew Albert Salomov, world champion. Mm. And he beat me on a split decision, which I thought I won. So it was 2-1 to him. I thought, I honestly thought I won. I think he only got it because of his name and who he was. And and then he went on to win the silver, he won, he won a silver medal in the Olympics, qualified obviously, and went to the Olympics. Jesus. Then the next qualifier, I couldn't, I was struggling to make weight. So I, I, I was, I was, I wanted to move up to 64 kilograms, but obviously I knew that it was national champion at 60 and I wouldn't have got the opportunity to go to 64, but I moved up anyway. Then there was all this big issue where the Irish team wanted to sign me, but the IABA, which is the governing body, wouldn't allow it. So they sent me to, just wouldn't allow it because they're saying about, about opening a can of worms for every other boxer. They want to move in that weight and, why is he getting an opportunity to go and I, I want to go in this weight? And it, it, it's all politics in boxing, especially the Irish boxing. So I went to the qualifier at 64 kilograms out in Azerbaijan. And while I was out there, there was two other fighters at 64 kilos. And because they were, had already boxed for Ireland at 64 kilos, they wouldn't allow me to box. So I was out there for nothing. And that was the last qualifier. And from that, I didn't, obviously, I didn't get the fight. And then I just I moved up. You, t- you talked about there about politics and boxing and me and Stephen are obviously a world boxing fan but more casual obviously you know far more about us and from the outset it seems like it's all politics now like even from the amateur level which it's obviously you think that's, you think amateur level shouldn't be any politics just be kids fighting or boxers but it seems to be all politics now to the point where it's not is it enjoyable still for you like to still like even to get into a fight now I think there's so much going on behind closed doors no it's, it's politics right through like especially amateur boxing is covered in politics like, and you have judges who are out to, like, to steal kids dreams away from them by robbing them and referees and it's all committee they're all they're all one but they represent the club and then if they think that their fighter's fighting another good fighter they'll just rob that good fighter from the fight it's it's mad it's all politics and then the authorities up high up are just it's corrupt the core. McCann said it in mm-hmm. the 2016 Olympics. It's corrupt right through the core, and it is. Yeah. It's sad. Those kids put their fucking their life into it, like, and then just something be taken away from you so easy from someone just sitting by the side of the ring going, "He's not winning here. I don't care what he does. He's not winning." Yeah, and just yeah. mad. That's crazy. Like I'd said, we had Dana talked. Do you ever listen to Teddy Atlas, the boy who trained Mike Tyson? Uh, Mike Tyson, uh. yeah, and he he does a podcast, and he was talking about the corrupt nature of boxing even at the top level it's like if you go to Las Vegas or whatever and you see a big fight on you go to like the nicest restaurant in Vegas the night before the fight and you'll see all these people sitting together judges referees and they're like this shouldn't be happening like what's going on here like it's like this is just doesn't fit right by anyone and it seems to be to us as casual fans it seems so obviously corrupt that I don't know how how do you stop it you can't stop it you can't stop it the only way to stop is just kids dreams you're taking sure like let's see see professional boxing at the top level elite level they're all taking drugs every woman i don't care what anyone says they're all taking drugs canal alvarez floyd mayweather manny pacquiao yeah. they're all drug, they're all drug users and they have a system where they know exactly what cycle to take drugs and what cycle not to take drugs because that's when they'll be tested and when they'll not be tested I, I'm actually of the opinion that most top level athletes in every sport are taking drugs. Mm-hmm. Big time, I agree. Massive Even footballers. Yeah, big time. I agree. Just... No, just... <laughs> Sorry, Sean, go ahead. I just, I just think that everyone will take that extra wee. Like, if they know they're there going to get away with it, they'll do it. We've mm-hmm. seen it too many times before. Like, it's just Lance Armstrong, but... Stakeless, they're, they're all at it. Mo Farah is still running about and everyone's going, right, Mo, we know. <laughs> <laughs> You're not fooling anyone here, Mo, come on. You're not fooling anyone, mate. Okay. But like for, for, for me, like if everyone's taking it, then should not just make it legal then? If everyone's taking it, and then, then, then it's a level playing field then? Exactly, but it's just one of them things where, where does it, where does it stop? Mm. Like, at what, like, where does it stop? If, if it was made legal, you'd have scientists in the likes of Russia or Putin, like making his scientists come up with his better drug than the rest mm. of the world that's going to like enhance performance even more and give you that extra one or two or three percent. 
yeah. and even more again, and even more again, and it's just never going to end. And then countries will start competing like against each other in the area of drugs rather than like talent or hard working and yeah, like true. And uh, it's and also the, I'll go ahead, Tim. Sorry, the, like the problem with fighting sports. See, I with the whole steroids and performance enhancing drugs. Part of me thinks, as a fan, if it's something like sprinting, I would love to see Usain Bolt run 100 metres in two seconds. <laughs> I mean, that'd be fucking class. Yeah. But when yeah. it comes to fighting, when it comes to actually fighting someone and you've got one person who's not on drugs and one person who is, you yes. can kill that person. Yeah. <laughs> but I think people who take drugs are lazy. Yeah. That's what I mean. They're yeah. just lazy. They want to be better, quicker. They don't want to put the, the, the proper work in because your body's capable of, of going 12 rounds at a high intensity and having the, the muscle endurance to do it as long as you put the proper work in the year to full camp. And but, it, yeah. but it's also like mean? but it's also like if you're fighting someone, Sean, and you, and you know he's taking drugs and your trainer comes up to you, I'm not saying this happens, but and says, you're like, well, he's taking drugs, so for you to compete, do you need to take drugs? Then it's like a vicious cycle then, isn't it, though? Exactly, that's it, 100%. But me personally, it's just a no go for me. Like, no matter what, I believe I'll be people who are on drugs. Whoever's on drugs, it's just, it's, it's in, it's, I would enjoy the, defeating someone even more if I yeah. knew they were taking drugs. They were yeah. drug using to try and beat me and I destroy them. It would be, it would give me that extra wee air to, to do more damage. But it's like, also, if you think about it, I guess, sorry, Dan. No, go ahead. If you think about it, I guess, the average gym goer uses drugs. So oh, the sure. fucking the top level professional athlete, you bet your bottom dollar he's losing drugs as well. Yeah, it's so. all money. It's yeah. all money. People yeah. want to make money. You want to be millionaires, take drugs, and destroy people, batter them, be a be a smart role model for sport. You're loaded. You're million. You've cars. You've big houses. Why wouldn't you? Especially when you're coming from Mexico or fucking Panama or somewhere like that, run down, and now you're living the dream by just taking. St- steroids or whatever maybe you're taking the performance enhance but it's all about to get that competitive uh edge on your opponent and i think for me when i think about it i'm like where's the you say where's the end but for me it's like where's the start because you look at someone like tyson fury i can't remember what fit it was he fought a couple of years ago and he did his training camp somewhere really high up high altitude yeah. so but by the time he came back down he was he could actually go longer but if he's fighting someone who doesn't have that finance behind them to actually give them that training camp. Is that not kind of cheating then? It's not really level then? Exactly it, but that's when you say, that's when it starts at the elite level, because that's when everyone at the elite level has that finance backing. Mm. They're world champions. They've got big money, they've big sponsorship. They've Now, don't get me wrong, there's obviously, but once you hit the million mark, or the million, and around the million mark, you're, like, you're able to fund anything you want. Because you know your next fight's going to be worth more than a million or so mm-hmm. on. And your camp costs maybe a wee bit more. But then you, you have, once you hit that level, you have more people interested in wanting to work with you. So you'll have like, you may have sports scientists who want to come in with you. What the fuck do I need a sports scientist for? Do what? Yeah. To read my heart monitor, to read my, you know, it's good to have. We had it in Jordan's town. But do you really need it? Like, is it really, really important to have? Like, you have an s and coach, you have an attritionist, you have a coach, and that's all you really need. But if you have one, like, like, a, like a one person who can give you that, even that smallest edge, whether it's you can last 10 seconds longer than you would have done, that there can, that's the difference from you winning a belt or losing a belt or getting a fight in the, uh, like a, a world championship fight, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. That's what, it's all about the one percent. Always about the one percent, and that's that's what I think the elite fighters bring in so much people to track their training, so they can't take a step wrong in camp. And may I be? Oh, I'm gonna go a walk. No, don't go a walk. You have a serious session to do later. And I always go a walk during this thing. But we've 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 researched this. I'm going to walk would maybe hinder your performance here later, and then you'll not recover as well. So don't do it. Okay, yeah. I won't. Do you know what I mean? And that's just someone in a professional area telling you what's right and what's wrong. Whereas yeah. me, I'll just go to walk. I don't go to fuck. I'll still do exercise later on. And I may be tired. I may not recover that extra wee small bit as a shade, but so I'll not go to And that's the, that's the crazy thing about sports stars now and even big footballers now. They're all like robots now. They're like, you be here at this point. You eat this here. There's no like... That's it. 
Even when you see like he's, 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 he's like something like it's just like I love Wayne Rooney, one of my favorite footballers of all time. Do you ever see him trying to fucking talk? He's like a fucking bore. Like Jesse Lingard, players like this here, like oh my, you are no crack because they're obviously programmed from the from four years old to be a professional that's footballer. Right through, they're just that's exactly it. Media attention from the wage, and you're not allowed to say it. Don't say it. You're not allowed to say it. And that. I think the best people, the, the best personalities in the Premier League, probably the best league in the world, are the managers because mm. they're all from back in the day, old school. Like you don't care. Jose Mourinho like doesn't care. Yes, he's probably a prick, but that's that's it's it's probably the best one to get. There. At least he's been himself. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I, I think that's, that's why, why I kind of like I kind of like we need to speak to someone like yourself. And then we were speaking to Paddy the other week, and obviously you've got Mickey Conlon who makes these public statements. It's, these are all local lads that are just calling out a lot of bullshit. You know what I mean? They're just calling out a lot of bullshit. That there's a lot of people who are programmed not to say stuff. Like even Paddy when he was at the Olympics, like he made the news, but he was right. Do you know what I mean? He was just just calling out a lot of shit that I feel like it takes people who are not programmed in that way just to be like, nah, I'm not going to hold my tongue. I'm not media trained. I'm just going to say what I want. No, no, that's exactly it. They're just, what what do you you have to lose? Do you know what I mean? I I always have a saying between the lads anyway, like between me, Paddy and all the other saying, see people from Belfast, we're the most, like, we're the most real people in the world, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then even people from Dublin, all their bit, I just think they're just bullshit. And they just talk shit. And I think the English <laughs> people talk shit. I just think the people from Belfast just are the most real and just don't care. Like, but it, all, it, it works for your advantage. Like you look at something like even Zlatan and Ibrahimovic, people go, Oh, he's so out there. It's like, because he's just been himself. And for you, Mayo Conlon, and all too, people like that there, and, and your interviews are, are becoming famous now because you're not, you're not media trained to the point where you're going to be programmed to say a certain thing or response you're like i'm just going to say how i feel and people like that people know people see that people because he's real he's being himself and i like that i want to see what he does next so you actually get more attention from being yourself yeah 100 percent. like i don't get me wrong i've had people like going to me you need to cut this out you need to cut that out like this person out you need why my dad's on me sean that person i go don't mean to do it it's just when you're talking to me you're talking to me Mm. like and my dad's like, oh, but Sean, you have kids watching and sponsors and all. I mean, what about sponsors? Yeah. Like, people don't want to sponsor people. I mean, don't sponsor me. <laughs> you want me to, don't, if you don't like me because of curse, don't sponsor me. I don't want your money. Simple as that. Like, it goes on over. It's not about, like, it's a, your cursing comes with a price, does it? Like, is it? And I was like, that, so what? See if I found a bump sending me in the street. I ain't going to curse. Mm-hmm. Just because there's a camera on me, you think, don't curse. Mm-hmm. I'm not cursing because I want to curse and sound like an idiot, but I'm just cursing because it's what I do every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I'm talking to people, that's now I do have bad, bad language, but if someone is going to say, oh, I'm not sponsoring him, his language is atrocious. Fuck him. No, don't sponsor me. <laughs> Fuck but you. I, th- I think it's good as well for us. Like for like, Obviously, you're, you're now in the media now, and like, you're getting interviews and stuff, and obviously, thanks for coming on the podcast and stuff. But like, mm-hmm. when I see you, I'm like, I, that, I, that's a, someone from Belfast then like I can relate to that a wee bit I'm like he's someone yeah. like I, I would grew up with and I would have known because he is himself when you see people yeah. go on these like do interviews or do podcasts and they're like they're robots I'm like how can I like mm-hmm. how can we kids aim towards that that's not real that's mm-hmm. not achievable that's, that's, that's all fake yeah. that's that's exactly it. that's an hour hang of a saying the dad like he's like seeing videos on Instagram you need to cut that out curse more as kids and I was like dad listen kids are going to curse anyway yeah. It doesn't matter, Sean. And he's like, that. just, I listen to you growing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just technically it's your you fault. So, I mean, kids are not cursing the parties. Belfast we live in. You know what I mean? It's not Beverly Hills we live in. <laughs> Oh. Here, uh, going go back to go back to politics and sports. I want to go back to like the I think it was like the Commonwealth Games in 2015. I think you you were trying to you were trying to qualify, and you fought some guy called was it Joe Joe Fitzpatrick? Oh, I was in that uh, 2014. I was 14. Uh, and you, and you the I mean, because you made a point on Paddy's Paddy Barnes podcast, and I was like, oh shit, I didn't really hear what he said there. I want to kind of ask him about that there. You said that you felt that you won the fight, but the people who were judging the fight, the people who wanted the other guy to win, basically above you. Yeah, of course. I, I did win the fight. It was a fact. It was, it was easy. It was an easy fight. 
And I like Joe Fitzpatrick. It's not his fault, but mm-hmm. I, I was set up, literally set up to lose. Like, and when we took, the, when they first arisen the odds, I was Irish Elite champion. I was number one in the country. I shouldn't have been a box off. But he lost in the Irish Elites and I won them. So technically I'm number one in Ireland. He lost to someone else. But they didn't want to pick me. They didn't want me to go. So they only forced two box offs across the whole way. So it was me and Paulie McCrory. And they set Paulie McCrory up and they set me up. We asked for mutual judges to come up from Dublin. And he says, no. My coach says, well, we want mutual judges. So we're not boxing off. And he says, we're not boxing off him because we're going to send you up to Patrick. You're not know, boxing off. So my coach says, look, listen, we're going to have to fight regardless. Because, like, so we got, we can't go on for meetings and meetings and trying to, the county, the county board, and then we got, um, we got two mutual judges off in Dublin. But there's five judges here, and out of a random selection, someone randomly selects three judges, and their scores are the only scores that count. So the other two judges are void in this fight. So we got two judges off in Dublin, which we were hoping would be part of the panel for the five judge fight, which they were. But at the end of the round, or at the end of the fight, them two judges were made void. Wow. And I just got set up with the other three judges, and I was beat two uh, one on a split decision. And I was, I just, I was, I don't even know what to say. I just went, "Fuck me, this is brutal." We devastated oh, the win, yeah. Like you're like one step away from going to the Commonwealth Games, was, and then that happens. Like you feel like you're getting robbed. I was. It was like you're literally getting robbed. Of like, like pfft. you don't know how far. Like going to the Commonwealth Games would catapult your your career, like yeah. and. I, f- I felt I would win gold early like, and Joe Fitzpatrick won a silver. I, like, I, the guy who beat him in the final, I, I sparred him plenty of times. I know exactly how the fight would have went if I had a photo and had a box to hit him. I felt I would have like, anyway. And I just think the politics locally should, like, doing that on their own people is, it's just fucking stinking. Like, and it's all down to a certain someone, individual at the time was a president of Ulster Boxing. Um, in fact, I'll say his name, Paul McMartin, was the president of the Sir Boxing, and he didn't like me. He didn't like my coach. He didn't like my club. He just had this fucking hate towards us, and he always did. Mm. And that's what it was down to. Basically, he set me up to, to lose. Was there like anything in particular why he didn't like you? Like, did something happen before, or was it just like he just didn't no, like gratitude first, and shit? First, first of all, he didn't like my club. He doesn't like my club, and he doesn't like my coach. Simple as that. And I don't know why. It's so weird because, like, some like I, I, if you didn't speak out about this here, we would never have heard about it. So, how how often does this actually happen to fighters like you? Like, you're so close to like going to the Commonwealth Games, and then to be fair, if it happened to me, I would probably just give up or being so pissed off or so disillusioned with boxing and amateur boxing, you just you throw the gloves up. But then you thank God for you, you kind of kept going and you told the story. But how many boxers just gave up because of an an, an event or a situation like that? You would, you would you would score the referee, the talent that's walked away from boxing because of politics. The talent that we've that we breed in this country as as young kids get disheartened, throw their head up and just don't box again because of it. Um, but yet the same people thrive to make Ireland the greatest boxing nation in the world. But they're robbing their kids, the the good kids at a young age from achieving titles that will catapult them on to become the greatest fighters in the world. Some kids just get disheartened from it and just walk away. Cause, and then parents as well. Parents and my dad encouraged me to leave boxing. At one point, he's like, Sean, just okay. stick to playing for Gordon Mona and play football. See how boxing? No fucking shit. <laughs> not, like, it's not worth it. And I was like, I don't know, no, but I just can't go on. I don't know how or why. It, just, it disheartened me so much every time. Like proper, felt like someone was stuck in, sticking a knife in you. Like, yeah, but I don't know what made me want to go back. I don't know why. I still to this day like that feeling will never leave me. Like 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 remember that feeling will never leave me because it happened so many times. Even the Holy Olympics against Albert Salomon, I know I won that fight. He's world champion. He's the big name. He's the only guy that ever beat Lomachenko. He's he's this amazing fighter. But I fought him previous in the European Games and he beat me fair and square in the semi final. And I fought him again in the World Championships and I definitely won that fight. And it's on YouTube for everyone to see. But because of who he was, again, the, the judges just give it to him and I, I lose s- bad. 
But how, how does this get fixed then? If, if it happens at the lower league, like the 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 the, the home like, uh, the home uh, fights like in amateur boxing in Ireland and all too, and it happens in the world stage and the world championships, and I'm sure it happens in the Olympics, happens in Michael Collin, and it probably happens in obviously professional. So wh- how do you fix it then? You can't. They try and analyze the panel, the judging panel, each fight. How come you? Because there's so much different styles in boxing, so many different like. It's literally just a vote between the judges. And that used to be a computer scoring mm. where you used to point, 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 point. Then that was getting out of hand and people were getting robbed. And, but people just raw people because it's a vote now. It's literally down to a judge going, I think he won. Yeah. And they're analyzed after the fight. There, he's just like, for example, well, he's a boxer. He was on the move. I think he won because he done this. And then the other judge can go, no, I didn't think he won. I, I think he won because he went forward. He put the pressure on. He was trying to encourage the fight where the yeah. other fighter was moving. So the, you're coming from two different backgrounds here. One's, one likes boxing and one likes fighting. Mm-hmm. So the, the boxing, the one who likes boxing is going to vote for the boxer and the one who likes fighting is going to vote for the fighter. I suppose we, we do it as fans as well. Like the, the amount of times we're watching fights and Dan might think, that person's one, but I thought no here, that person's one. But because we're not experts, we don't know. But you like to think that the actual judges should be experts. But like sometimes you look at it and you go, some of these judges don't actually have much of a boxing background. No, you know no. what I mean? It's like they're, they're not they're not like retired pros or they're not they just seem to be just normal people that have went, I'll judge it. <laughs> so if you get involved or your local club as a volunteer, and then the local club goes, you do a coaching course, you do a judging course, or referee course, I'll do no sweat. And then they become a referee, judge national, and then they go, oh, fuck. Try and get their three star badge, go international. And then they go into the international judges, and then they go on the award stage at the elite level, and then it just, it just grows and grows. Yeah. And they're just normal, everyday fucking people. You know what I mean? Hey, did you think it would be better if you had actual, like, ex professional or ex amateur boxers there to the judge the fight rather than, as you said, these nobodies? That would be good, but I don't think you would, I don't think much fighters would do it. It's because first, first of all, it's a voluntary job. Volunteer really? do until a certain level. You don't get paid as a judge or referee, so you wouldn't. That's why until you hit that top elite level, like the Olympics, they have the AIBA have a thing called the Magnificent Seven, which is their seven panel judge judging and refereeing. They were paid a fortune, but then they all got sent home from Olympics in 2016 because they're all cheating. They were the best seven <laughs> judges in the world. And one of our own, Mickey Gallagher, who was Irish, was on that panel as one of the best judges and referees in the world. He was actually voted best referee and judge in the world in 2015. And he got sent home from 2016 Olympics for cheating. Jesus so, Christ. Like, if it happened at that level, judges, like... They were getting paid a fortune. A fucking fortune. That's the bad thing because human nature, like there is, there is, there is corruption in, in all of us in there, and that's the bad thing in it. When you give it down to a human decision, they're going to favor someone. Whether it's like someone, like if I was, I'm sure if I was judging it, I would obviously favor the Irish person. So in that sense, you're always going to be like, you know, biased yeah. towards a certain thing. Of course, you always. It's, it's, in your, it's like you say, it's in our nature. But as humans, and it's just unfortunate that people make a decision so easily. Just don't. To take yeah. someone's dreams away from them. So, so, Sean, now that you're you've went pro, have you noticed? Because we when we were talking to Paddy, like, obviously we're not experts. Paddy was basically explaining to us the the difference between amateur boxing and professional boxing. Like he was basically comparing it to like it's like hockey and hurling. They're like two different sports. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you just think certain fighters suit the professional game more than amateur. What do you make of it? What what is the big difference for you between the two? Speed, the speed of it. It's yeah. like. It's literally, it's when the old people used to say to me, people used to tell me not to go pro right up until I actually did go pro. Not to go, like, don't do it. You, you don't see the pro game. You're not a professional boxer style. You're a class amateur style. Go to the Olympics, do you? I was like, sure, listen, we'll see what happens. Like, mm-hmm. I've turned pro and I've talked it like a duck to water. <laughs> mm-hmm. So... It's just, it's, again, it's just a thought where people think, nah, I wouldn't do it, but I think it's easier. I think professional boxing is well easier than amateur boxing. Like, really? Elite level, elite level is 100 mile an hour. Like, boom, back four, back four. I was watching Kurt Walker in the Olympic qualifiers, a good friend of mine, used to stay in a room with Kurt for years in the Irish team, and we went 
went to all the major tournaments together as well. He still are going to qualify for Olympics. He's European champion now. And I watched his fight in the Olympic qualifiers there a couple of months ago, just before COVID. And it was I was going, no way to box like it. That is a hundred mile an hour. How can he even keep up with it? Yeah. But then, nah, it's so, for me, it's so relaxed. You have so much time between attacks and counter attacks. Whereas in the amateurs, it was just boom, 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 boom. It was just literally non stop for three rounds. 100 mile an hour, no time to think. It was just muscle memory. You throw punches based on muscle memory. You have no time to stop and think and set punches. It just, it just happens. Where now in the pro game, I have time to set something up, thought, pick your friend. Yeah. And I think it's easy. I know the the rounds are long. The rounds are longer, and the gloves are smaller, and you get hit harder. But if you have a set of balls, you you don't mind it. But did you find that hard? Just like initially when you did your first fight, like oh, this is so different, and you maybe had to train differently, you know? <clears throat> no, I, I thought it was all right because I knew you was fighting a journeyman my first fight, so I knew I was going to batter him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so but the, why are there so many journeymen, mate? That's not right. There's about a million journey, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're loaded. They're loaded. They're loaded. Oh. Just, it's just people just going to take a bait and off up and coming fighters. Yeah. But we said, as we say, we always say about the boxing records, there's always people who are 20 and 0, 30 and 0, but then there must be someone who's like not in 70. There's people out there who's like, one draw and fucking 49 losses. No oh, wins. Jeez. But like, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get yourself ready to fight that person? Do you know what I mean? You, you have to, me, personally, I know people who know they're going to win and they don't take camp seriously and they, they, just, they know they're going to win. But me, personally, I'm not training for that fight. Oh, yeah. I'm training yeah. for a career. I'm trying to get better every time I train. So when I'm fighting them type of people, I'm not training to fight that person. I'm training... To progress my career, mm-hmm. I'm not getting better for, for them, like just for that individual. I'm getting better for my career. I'm trying to bring in top spawn all the time and trying to learn by watching other fighters and just trying to progress my own career. So I'm not actually training for that journey, man. I'm training for where I want to finish is yeah. the elite and make of the sport. I think it's like back to the journey, man, for a second. Like, so these obviously journeymen are actually. Boxers who started off kind of like the way you started off, just like like boxing got into it. But did someone pull them aside? Uh, pull them aside and go here. You're not that good, but we can make you a lot of money. Like are they pulled aside uh-huh. and told you're going to be a journeyman, or is like they just kind of take one fit at a time? No, they're told. They are told. Like they're trained to survive. They're they're trained to survive because see if they get knocked out, they're not allowed to fight for twenty eight days, which means they're not allowed to earn no more money in twenty eight days. See if they survive and they go through the full round. So the tougher you are. And the more shrewd you are at actually hanging on to your fate, the more fate you're going to get. Because mm. you can fate every week and you can earn two grand a week. <laughs> has, there ever, has there ever been a journeyman who was actually getting battered and he just got really good and became like, maybe got a chance at the world title? Nah. Yeah, you well, call him Rocky, I mean, Rocky Balboa. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's a few people who's lost early in their career and they were terrible. And they've just, I'll give you one example Tevin Farmer. He's a. Uh, three or four time world champion at the minute he lost his, he lost like three or four or five fights out of his first ten yeah. shape and then he just <laughs> boom and just he beat James Tennyson from T- Pograss beat him for a world title he's class now unbelievable but he started off he wasn't wasn't great I know it just seems so it's a weird like job to get into like obviously before these fights you meet the person don't you you obviously meet the, the journeyman beforehand like what's that interaction like because most interaction with boxers usually you're kind of slabbering no shit talking do you even I shit talk with him that. there's nah he's only two he's just already on a few quiz so he just has to go and skim a beating and he knows that like he's just like he just knows he's he knows he's coming to get a beating he knows he's being set up to lose Jesus Christ! Like, just an, like they're only already on a few quid. They're literally just there to make money and split. They don't care. Like, so there must be then a lot of boxers with a lot of padded stats. Do you know what I mean? Oh, you you look at them on Wikipedia and they're fucking all sorts of no, but they actually haven't fought anyone. So it is really important to look at their record and see who they're fighting. Like, oh, big time! That's that's what all like. I've had a tough start in my career, but I've asked for it. I don't want to be fitting journeyman all the mm-hmm. time. So I. I think I only fought like three journeymen 
And then from yeah. there on in, I fought everyone were winning records right up. Every time I fought, I took a step up. MTK have managed me that way because they asked to be managed that way. And based on my performances, they had trust in me to take that next step each time. And yeah. every time I'm ranked high, when I have no belts, but I'm ranked very high in the UK, probably the toughest division across the whole 10 or 15 weights. And it's but because I, of the step up each time. But I think it's, it's the, the, the nature of boxing now. Like, cause if you, as you said, if you see someone who gets beaten the first five rounds, you all my leagues gets put in the, the back of the line or the back burner now. But like for boxing, you need 20 and 0 just to get a world title fight or like 15 and 0 now. You, you don't need, so if you see if you're like 20 fights in, five losses, 15 wins, you still don't get a chance now. No chance. Like, you're not good enough. <laughs> people want to see people. That's what makes it interesting. See people like, oh, like, if two people fight with an undefeated record, each other, it's like, Jesus, who's going to lose here? Like, mm-hmm. this is what they're watching. It's so like hard. Like, there's fury at time as well. Yeah, because you've never seen the flat. You've never seen them lose. So you can't mm-hmm. judge based on, it's very hard to pick a winner. Because you've never seen him lose. He's one of those weaknesses. That also makes really? it really hard sometimes in boxing for them to actually go and make the fights. Like, how long yeah. were we waiting for Pacquiao to fight Mayweather? I know, that's pathetic. That's exactly... Uh, it was absolutely shit when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> because Pacquiao had already lost, so yeah. he didn't care. Mayweather has never lost, so it was all... He's making it all technical, like, no, I want him tested. No, I'm not getting tested. Oh, would you need to get tested? Oh, I'm not fighting someone who I think is on drugs. And then it's all it's tit for tat. Yeah, and it's just just boxing. Like even when Mayweather fought Canelo, he drained that man before he no. fought. Him. So he did. Like, like Canelo would just look like a zombie when he got into the ring. I know Mayweather destroyed him. Like, but yeah. like, it's all down to the tactics of fight yeah. week and having control over your opponent. What do you What do you think of the the big boys in in the boxing? The the Furies, the Joshua, the Wilder. Where do you stand on that? Do you think they get pushed mm-hmm. too much? I think Fury just the best out of them all anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, I think most boxers them. think that as well. Like, but um, I just think they just need to fight each other. Like, they're making millions upon millions. Who cares? Just fight and mm-hmm. f- raise up. <laughs> so why is it all having to all this money and no, I want to fight here. No, I don't. I don't think it'll happen now for a long, long time with, because of COVID. Yeah. Do you think more and the right men put them fights home and no spectators because they could make right. millions do you think Joshua gives Fury a better fight than Wilder gives him? No. No? Like really? The same way? Uh, I think Fury destroys Joshua. He's too robotic. No That's hair saying as well. Very easy to hit. Wilder is very relentless. You can't even, you can't see what he does. You, you can't teach it. What Wilder does, it's, it's, it's unorthodox. He throws punches from the back of the hall. Yeah. But he doesn't, and he's falling in and there's no Bombs. technique to punches. So you can't read him. Yeah. You can't sit and throw a punch. You can't roll and throw. You can't defend and or counter you attack. Can read, you can read Joshua coming easy enough. Read Joshua like a bird. He throws a one tear a jab. Slip it, bang, left hand. Or yeah. ro- like, he's so robotic, so upright. You see his punches coming. We're well, Wilder's throwing punches from here. He's yeah. throwing up, round. He hits you around there. He, doesn't care how he hits when he does hit you, you're hit like. Yes. <laughs> so you, you think? So you think Fury would beat Joshua? But would you think Wilder could beat Joshua? I think, it, Wilder, it, I think Wilder beats Joshua too. Yeah. Oh really? I think, I think Fury beats Joshua. I really, I really, really like Wilder good. as well. Before I always said he's. I just mm-hmm. think he just he's leaves so people cool. stiff. He's so, <laughs> cool. he's so cool as well, Wilder. He's a big, he's a beast of a man, like. Uh, here, Sean, before you go, I want to ask you something just uh, based on, on that uh, TV show that came out during the week or last week. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, When Boxing Ends. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a thing I want to bring up to you. I, I don't know, me and Steve were debating it because you're at the start of your career. So it's not probably talking yes. about the end already. But like, would you, now nah, being like conscious about it, would you think long term now? Oh, I already have. I've, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly where I'm going, what I'm doing. I know when I want to retire. I only want to be in boxing until I'm about 32, max. Yeah. I want to world title before I'm 32, get in, get out. And I want to coach. I want to coach in boxing. I want to open my own gym. And I just want to... At, at coaching, I'm going to win the coaching like a million percent. Um, yeah. I'm going to, I want to open my own gym. 
and that's I've already done a course. I've done a, a like a phase one and phase two S and C course or oh, yeah. strength and distance course with uh, EPA. So I, I actually qualifies me to the coach like S and C. See a test here in a couple of weeks. So hopefully pass that and then um I I that means I can work on a a private or a semi private gym which I'm going to open anyway. That's the plans. That's good. And, 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 even, like even if I was to make millions from boxing night, I still don't want to retire. Like retire from right. Like I I don't want to retire thirty two and just move about all day and sit about the house and because yeah. I have these money or going holidays. I want to actually have. I want to coach. I want to have a keep purpose. At, I want to have a purpose. Like mm. I want to give back to the community. I want to help out with coaching and boxing and. I still do a wee bit now, like up in Holy Trinity and stuff. Um, the other day I went up and just helped out with the kids coaching and just teaching from my experience what I learned on the Demons, which is probably international boxing, which not very much people could teach in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and see, so you're obviously with uh, was it M- was it M- MTK Promotions? MTK. Do they do they help you with that? Do they, they they tell you when you come in like maybe prepare long term, or are they just all about the here and now? No, well, they don't really teach you. They don't really hang it. It's up to you, really. But if you, if you go and ask for help from them, they'll help you in any way possible. Like, I've, been, I've like, Sandra, Sandra Vaughn, my coach's wife, she's a CEO of the company, or she was a CEO of the company of MTK, and she's always telling me, like, what I need to do is, if any money you make, put in the houses and do this, mm-hmm. and any help Best. you need. Like, if I'm, if I'm opening a gym, I'm going straight to her yeah. for help. If I'm going to, a house, I'm gonna to go to her and ask, "What do you think?" And what? I, and she'll help me. And it's like she's an entrepreneur. Like she's, she's done it herself. She's loads of businesses. She's loads of property. Um, and she's to me would be big a big help for me. Like, and she would definitely help and steer me in the right way and help any way she could. And MTK have a lot of people working for them. Where the help is never ever too far away. Like. Um, yeah, to be fair, I've, I've only heard good things about MTK even from in, in Paddy and stuff. But uh, it, are all promotion companies that helpful though? I think feel like some promotion companies and some promoters don't care really about the boxer per se, all about the money. Yeah. See, MTK are a management business, so they manage our career. Mm. Um, they put on shows. They help us. See, to be honest with you, they help us. They they're giving more to us than what we're giving them. Realistically, like yeah. Um, and. It's what you'll not get that from anyone else. No one else, no promoter, no no one else. They don't care about you. Yeah. They'll never give you that help. MTK, that's why they're so good. You'll never hear anyone speak bad about them because no one else offers what they offer. Yeah, yeah. But here, Sean, yeah. before you go, what's uh, what's next for you? You, you have a, a fight plan like, uh, lined up or just training? I think I've been accepted to fight for a Commonwealth title. But I'm not sure when or where or who I was against. Um, I would love to be out before the end of the year. Like I would really love to be out end of November, start of December. I'm training every day anyway. I'm only training once a day at home, but I'm still training, taking over every day. You still feel fit? Um, no, I still fit in that. So I'm still enjoying my grub and all and whatnot, but I'm, I'm taking over every day because what else am I to do? You know what I mean? That's my job still. So as I say, I'm still training and still doing weights, getting strong and just trying to progress in certain areas like like I say getting strong and doing a wee bit more boxing and yeah. hopefully something comes up before the end of the year I've spoke briefly to my manager and Jamie Collins says just hoping November December but it's I know with the, with the current situation with COVID-19 it's not it's not that easy to do so just have to hold out and see it is it's so because obviously I'm sure you prefer boxing with spectators there like you obviously probably get a buzz off that not too so it's kind of weird for you <laughs> Yeah, big time. Like it's, it's that's what makes boxing the spectators, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Sean, actually, that's all we have. To be fair, that was great. We chat. Really appreciate you coming on. Enjoyed that. Thanks for having me.